remember from, from last year, um, my glasses were broken. They're still broken. Yeah. But I kind of like it that way almost, you know? It's kind of nice. It's like a pair of jeans with holes in them. Okay, uh, so you guys have all seen or heard the sound of music. Really? It's a trick question. So I could be talking about the, the, the musical, or I could just be talking about music in general. Have you seen or heard the sound of music? <laughs> Get it? OK. So um, uh, the hills are alive. So I've titled this the music of sound, because you can't have music unless you have sound. I mean, it kind of like they're the same thing. Um, but we, we can certainly distinguish this compared to this. All you need is love, right? It's like singing and one's just sound, right? So that's, that, that's, we're going to talk about that uh, today. I think um, if you don't know who Kenneth Morris is, really, really, really quick, Kenneth Morris is Welsh and he immigrated uh, to the United States um, somewhere. Ken, do you remember w around what time it was he went to Loma Land to teach? Early 1900s. Early 1900s, basically. And he taught literature at um, Point Loma, at the, the, at the uh, society there. Um, and he wrote um, an essay called The Three Bases of Poetry. The first base is vision, which is what I talked about last year. The second one is music, which I'm going to talk about, and the third one is style. Um, so music, uh, while I was reading it, it was harder for me to, to um, create a presentation about, because for me it was something that was very personal to Kenneth Morris, his view of music and poetry. So therefore, his language that he uses to talk about his point of view is also very you know, uh, personal and very Kenneth Morris. And also he wrote it, um, you know, almost 100, I mean, gosh, it's getting, yeah, maybe 80 years ago. So the English is, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know anybody who, who talks like him or writes like him anymore. It's beautiful. So anyway, let's get started. Um, yeah, okay. So, so I'm going to read from my paper and um, a lot of quotations from his, his paper will come up on the screen so you can follow along really easily. So basically what I'm going to do is I'll, it'll, you'll, I'll, you'll see something and I'll read something from his paper and then I will briefly uh, explain you know, my, my take on that for you guys. So the introduction. So we use the verb to compose, to express the act of creating music, but it is with poems alike that we do compose. It seems by virtue of the verb compose that composition welcomes music in both forms. There is another usage, however, right? When we want to know what something is made of in its entirety, we ask, of what is it composed? Of what is the flower, the leaf, the mountain, the water, the air, or the song of a bird composed. This verb leaves nothing out. However, we can ask ourselves, I'm sorry, however, can we ask ourselves what are we composed of and arrive at an answer that is whole? Struggling to regain our composure, walking past a garden, we don't notice the smell of the flowers or the color of the leaves oblivious to the full composition of such a scene, we don't experience ourselves as a part of it. So how do we express what we don't experience? It is this compositional relationship to one's environment that Kenneth Morris argues. Such poets as Christopher Marlowe, William Shakespeare, and John Milton engaged and expressed through their verse. So this is from Kenneth Morris's second, uh, from his essay. So music, no less than vision, is an essential of poetry because poetry is the pressure 
of the soul upon words, and the soul lives in a world of music. So if the soul lives in a world of music, its environment then is musical. Hence, poetry that emerges from the deeper instruments of our soul are thus composed of music, making poetry indelible to song. Vision is also essential to this relationship in terms of the poet's standpoint or view. When we listen to music, can we see its instruments? Can we see the mountains, the stream, and the trees behind the melody? Can we see ourselves in the bird and hear our own voice in her song? We are lapped in the music of the spheres, all existence's vibration. Mm. So, according to... So Kenneth Morris then references this, a couple people who I, I, don't, I probably don't know anybody who knows who these people are, but he references them to, to talk about this um, vibration. One person's name is Isaac Leopold Rice, and he wrote a book published in 1883 called What is Music? And this is where Kenneth Morris, I think, is introduced to the idea of the kung, um, and that was brought up very briefly last year in my, in, when I was talking about vision. So according to Isaac Leopold Rice, in his book, What is Music, published in 1883, in Chinese musical theory, there is the kung, which corresponds to our F, the tone on the, the music scale, which, is, which, cor which by modern physicists is to be the actual tonic of nature. Now, this is what physicists in the modern time of 1883 were saying, so keep that in mind. Um, so Kenneth Morris had known about the Kung. Uh, at the beginning of his story, I read a story last year called The White Bird Inn, and I don't know if you remember that story, but basically, um, great, wonderful, yeah. Basically, he, you know, he, he, he's kind of just you know, intellectually uh, polluted, in, <laughs> I mean, in a way. And it's not that his, his knowledge of poetry and, his, and his, his, his encyclopedic reference point of poem, poems and poets isn't helping him, but he kind of just never really lets go of that. So when he's walking through the forest, he's reading poems as he's walking through the forest, right? It's kind of like, you know, you don't really hear the bird song. You don't really notice your surroundings if you're there with your walking down with a book in your face, you know? Um, so at the beginning of his story, uh, the character, uh, uh, Zhao, he's described as having yet to have heard the key tone of nature. Really, it's the kung. So uh, in the White Bird Inn, Zhao, uh, he hears not the wind intoning the kung among the forked and elbowed pine branches above him. So he's not hearing or experiencing the music of his surroundings or his total composition um, however, later towards the end of the story, he listens. Uh, it became too dark to read. And Chao Shi soon closed his book and looked out over the mountain world and then at last forgot his old strivings and desires. All at once he heard lute music and singing lovelier than any singing he had ever heard in his life. The night deepened, the moon rose over the snow peaks, the waters of the river below, the wind among the pine branches, the murmur of the pine needles overhead seemed a part of her song. He listened and all the music being one, he heard the mountain voices intone the great kung. So, speaking of the key note of nature, again, uh, Kenneth Morris references another scientist kind of person, Benjamin Silliman. Uh, he, he wrote in a book called The Principles of Physics, which was published in 1860, even earlier. And he said that the aggregate sound of nature, as heard in the roar of a distant city, you guys are all going to New York, let me know if you hear the kung. 
or the waving foliage of a large forest is said to be a single definite tone of appreciable pitch. This tone is held to be middle F on the pianoforte, which may therefore be considered the keynote of nature. So the moment Chao closes his book and he just walks through the forest and he hears the kung, the vision and music of poetry begin to resound um, before and on all sides. That's actually a, a, a Kenneth Morris's language, before and on all sides. So Zhao's very composition becomes the far waters. So he becomes the far waters the voice of the night birds in the valley, the long so and whisper of the wind among the pines. He becomes all those things. He's not just reading about them anymore. He experiences those things through his senses. He intones himself. He intones the kung. He intones or performs. If it's music, we perform music. So he's performing. He's a performer in that moment. He's per performing the kung together with nature from where his standpoint resides. So opposing forces, opposing forces brought together, right, under a fulcrum of balance creates harmony, not only in music, but in life. Differences may be reconciled by a harmonization of opposites brought together by their shared nature, in this case, music. The diversity of tones or notes on a musical scale all manifest from the same source, sound. We don't need much proof to verify what music is and isn't. Its vibrations resonate within our ear and declare, I am song. <laughs> the mind is the great slayer of the real. <laughs> Let the disciple slay the slayer and at once the music of the spheres and of the soul, which is divine, shall become audible to him. More than that, it shall be the very stuff of his life, the palpitation of his consciousness. It's beautiful. So music epitomizes the relationship of self and other, A and B, violin and cello, into an expression of balance and harmony. So we can recognize music from sound in obvious ways. The sound of the bell ringing in our alarm clock is not the music of the bells of Indonesian gamelan. <laughs> uh, patrons in a cafe talking over each other simultaneously seems more a cacophony of speech rather than the harmony of voices together in a barbershop quartet. It's quite obvious. We seem able to recognize verse also from what is just prose by its musical qualities alone, even if we don't understand the language. I have a feeling that when I click on the hyperlink, it's gonna give the answer away. <laughs> but the point makes its case. Far away. Dwi am fynd â thi i ffa roc away, ffa roc away. Mae enw'r lle yn gitar yn fy mhen, yn gor o rhythmau haf a llanwr môr, yn sgwrs cariadon dros goffi crwy ar ôl taith drwy'r nos mewn pick-up du, yn oglau petrol ar ôl glaw, yn chwilio'r lleiad law yn llaw. Ok, so you can kind of see what languages, who, what languages he's speaking, do you think? Is it? Then what did he say? <laughs> Can I repeat it a little bit? Yeah, I'll play a little bit, a bit, a bit more. Far rock away. Dwi am fynd â thi i ffa rock away, ffa rock away. Mae enw'r lle yn gitar yn fy mhen, yn gor o rhythmau haf a llanwr môr. Yn sgwrs cariadon dros goffi crwy ar ôl taith drwy'r nos mewn pick-up du. Welsh. Welsh poetry. Far away. 
<laughs> something. So um, I think it's really easy, even though none of us maybe know Welsh, we know he's reading poems. Right? Um, it's interesting to do this with any language, Swahili, Icelandic, you know, I mean, if, you, if you're looking for it, you know what you're looking for, but you can do it with, with your friends, and it's, it's really quite simple. Same thing with speeches. We know when someone's giving a speech because of the way it sounds. We know when someone's having a conversation by the way it sounds. We know when teenagers are having a conversation because of the way they sound. When we probably know what they're talking about because of the way they sound. I mean, when I was in Japan riding the train and there were two girls, you know, sitting next to me giggling the whole time, I, I'm not exactly sure what they're talking about, but it's probably not theosophy. <laughs> or maybe it is. <laughs> okay. or, or maybe it was about me. Look at that funny guy with the tie. <laughs> okay. That's, that's fine, right? Okay. Okay. So... from Kenneth Morris, meter. This is a, a, a poetry term. Meter may not be an essential, but music is. Just for the reason that poetry is a reality out of the heart of God and the universe, and not, as you may have supposed, an arbitrary invention of man. So today, poetic forms are less dependent on traditional metrical style and many poets write in a verse free of any meter altogether. I'll talk about meter in a little bit. But according to Morris, even in today's world of experimental poetry and free verse, music is essential. He says it right there. Speaking from the heart, um, an expression from the standpoint of your total composition is one that includes the universe, your surroundings, Invariably, your soul plays music if you're doing that, no matter how you versify it. However, this also demonstrates how many forms of poetry of the past and of the present may sometimes seem like lifeless intellectual puzzles, <laughs> inventions of man that pose in the costume of poetry, lacking what Mara said earlier, that pressure of the soul upon words. So quickly, a uh, little background, if you're not familiar with uh, how poetry, the structure of poetry, and I am no expert. Um, I'm really just a, a person who likes poetry, and, and I'm not, an, I'm, I, it's something that I always have to review beforehand, even when I talk about it. Uh, so if, if you guys have insight afterwards, we can, we can chat a little bit. Um, so the iambic pentameter is um, kind of the basis for English verse or English poetry. Um, I am means, um, well, an I am is that's it. It's an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. So it sounds something like da dum, Japan, Brazil, Holland. I don't know, maybe that's the opposite. So, and pentameter. Um, if you know Greek a little bit, means five, right? So, it, so iambic pentameter is five iams. Da-dum, 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 right? You can almost hear the poetry, you can almost put it in there. Da-dum, 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 da-dum. Um, okay. That's Chaucer. Um, if you're not familiar with who Chaucer is, um, we'll, we'll learn a little bit about him, I guess, right now. Uh, the order is going to go Chaucer, Marlowe, and Shakespeare, then Milton. So that's actually a painting done by William Blake, much later of Chaucer. Um, Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales, before that, most people would probably talk about Beowulf or something like this, but Chaucer came much later. So Morris says that Chaucer looked, um, actually, let me see, yeah, let me see here. Did I get this right? Yeah. Chaucer said, well, Morris said that Chaucer looked on the surface of things. Um,
Or he looked on the surface of life, a thing woven of the gay colors of myriads of ever differing personalities. Um, let's see here. I think I'm, I'm kind of a little lost, pardon me. Yeah, there we are. Okay, let me back up, forgive me. So I just told you about Ma Chaucer. This is really important, I shouldn't have missed this. So he thinks that, he says that Chaucer imprisoned the world tones and English strings. So he's saying that Chaucer puts music, Chaucer creates iambic pentameter. He pretty much starts that. He's the first person to really do that. But Morris says he, he, he's missing something. He's putting the tones in prison. And if they're in prison, that means they're not free and they need to get out. But nonetheless, they're there. The music is there, right? You can go visit the music in jail and bring him a cake or something, right? But they're not gonna come visit you and their, their audience is quite limited. So this is really calculated language Morris is using to talk about his point of view with Chaucer. So this is Chaucer's language. This is from the Canterbury Tales. Um, so, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. so when April with the showers sweet with fruit, the drought of March has pierced into the root. So as you can see, fruit and root, they rhyme, right? So in, on, this ne on the right-hand side of the slide, it says AA, so that shows you that that's like a, you know, they're like a, com they're like a couplet or something. And bathe these vein with liquor that has power to generate therein and sire the flower when Zephyr also has with his sweet breath quickened again in every holt and hath. So they all rhyme and they're all in this iambic pentameter. This is the beginning of English verse. So take note that they all rhyme at the end right now. Okay. He says that he looked on the surface of things, a thing woven of the gay colors of myriads of ever differing personalities. So what does he mean by that? I think uh, one way of interpreting that is that the surface of life being that canvas. So if you think of life as a canvas, it's something for which to go beyond. And last year I used uh, a term Blavatsky uses in the proem of the secret doctrine. She uses the term transmural view. So if you see through by a means of a transmural view of life, you're going beyond some kind of limit past just the canvas. So this sort of vision not only sees a transmural view way of seeing the world, not only sees but also hears the kung in tone, as Zhao eventually does in the story. So Morris says Chaucer's business was to make a vehicle for poetry, not himself to bring poetry through into the world. So it is unimportant like he, um, unimportant that he, like Dryden, Pope, and Byron, and like them alone among the great figures in English first, was untouched with mysticism. Gosh, it almost sounds like Morris doesn't like Chaucer. But that he doesn't, that's not true, he does. He does like Chaucer, I'll tell you why. Um, but, so he, untouched with mysticism, what does Morris mean by mysticism? This is a very problematic terminological kind of thing. I mean, it's a problematic word, mysticism. So what does Morris mean? Well, there's a footnote directly after this passage in his paper that references someone named Caroline Effie Spurgeon. And she defines mysticism at the very beginning of her book, this is from 1913, and the book is called Mysticism in English Literature. And this is what she says at the very beginning. This is who Morris quotes. Mysticism is a term so irresponsibly applied in English that it has become the first duty of those who use it to explain what they mean by it. That's what I'm doing. The concise Oxford Dictionary from 1911, I'm sure it hasn't changed much, after defining a mystic as one who believes in spiritual apprehension of truths beyond the understanding, adds, where it's mysticism, noun, often contempt. Whatever may be the precise force of the remark in brackets, is, it is unquestionably true that mysticism is often used in a semi-contemptuous way to denote vaguely any kind of occultism or spiritualism, or any specially curious or fantastic views about God and the universe. Oh my gosh, how, I mean, 
why would people even, why would people want to do that? <laughs> okay. So, um, Morris wants us to pay attention to this definition of mysticism because he criticizes Chaucer of lacking that. So it was Chaucer's lack of curiosity to go beyond what Morris boldly argues was his, quote, fictitious medieval religiosity, which animated, I'm sorry, which demonstrated no animated picture with the whole mentality of his man of law. He's talking about his characters in the Canterbury Tales. So no animated picture of his characters, of his man of law or his nun. So he's got like the, you know, the nun in the, in the story or the man of law. But still, this does not lower the quality of Chaucer's work, but rather stabilizes the contribution of his literature and its epochal quality into a greater historical context of poetic vision. In a discussion of the mystical vision and musical depths of self as expressed through poetry, Chaucer held up no torch to lighten the inner world, as it is the mission of poetry to do. It is the mission of poetry to lighten the inner world, and Chaucer didn't quite do that in Morris's view. And later Morris says about mysticism that it is nothing, mysticism is nothing but awareness of the soul of the God within, the divine part of ourselves. So that's Morris's. So it was as the coming of a Prometheus who at last, with this rhymeless iambic pentameter for fennel stock, brought down fire from heaven. So none other than Christopher Marlowe, there he is with his cool, poofy jacket. Some people think I, you know, I, I, I wear my tie, he wears that. So Christopher Marlowe comes later, and he brought fire down from heaven for poetry. So this is iambic pentameter again. Now, you'll notice a difference now. Um, there's a clue at the top. <laughs> This is what's called blank verse, and this is uh, from his Tamburline. Uh, I'll try to read this so you can get a sense of the music. Um, if all the pens that poets ever held had fed the feeling of their master's thoughts and every sweetness that inspired their hearts, their minds and muses on admired themes, if all the heavenly quintessence they still from their immortal flowers of posy, wherein, as in a mirror, we perceive the highest reaches of a human wit, if these had made one poem's period and all combined in beauty's worthiness, yet should there hover in their restless heads one thought, one grace, one wonder at the least, which into words no virtue can digest. So what's the difference here? They don't rhyme at the end. That's it, really. I mean, superficially speaking. But it's still iambic pentameter. If all the pins that ever poets held, I am five. So this is, I know this is my, if you're not into this, I mean, in terms of like the structure of poetry, I understand. but. Uh, it's, it's interesting to show this, the, how the evolution, um, how, these po how poetry evolves through these two poets. Okay. So, yes. It carries you. Yeah. Yeah. It carries you. Your microphone carries you, too. It carries you, she says. Yeah, I think that's how, I think I would think, I think that's how Kenneth Morris feels too. Um, and we can't really prove that. I can't show you why it carries you, but you feel it, right? And that's, that's what this is all about, right? This is really interesting. Morris has the most interesting way of uh, explaining things. So he says, he made the music of English blank verse, and he made it, a march. So what does Morris mean by a march? 
So consider that a march involves a relationship between a person's feet and the ground of his being. In this case, literally. The surface upon which you march is the ground upon which you walk. So insensitive to the difference in terrain, you feel nothing. In terms of sound, hearing only the chatter of your mind, whether it be sand, pavement, or hardwood floor, smooth, wet, dry, rocky, or bare, barefoot with sandals, running shoes, or boot, our feet lead the rest of our body in some direction. Where are you going? Do you notice the difference beneath your feet? As time inexorably moves forward, whether we traverse ahead or not, it goes with or without us. Time marches on, as the saying goes. Do you guys have that expression in Dutch, time marches on? Probably, I guess, by that brief silence, no. But it's actually an expression in English. I didn't make that up. That's an actual English idiom. Um, Something similar? Something similar? Could someone say it? Just curious. It's interesting how in English we, we have created a metaphor of time with marching. And time marches on. It's, that's very interesting. And so Kenneth Morris has tapped into that expression and he's using that to explain how Christopher Marlowe's poetry sounds and feels and looks even. I mean, you can see a march if you think about it. Um, so if there be a poetry that marches on as time does, it would be one, I'm sorry, it would be as one melody is to another when in harmony, audibly distinct but together as one music. Time and self or self and other when marching are one. When we listen to the sound of water, we become the water as much as it becomes us. And this dissolution of self and other is the march of time. All encompassed in its movement, we harmonize with its substance and manifest no difference. We emerge thus as music and become musical people or beings or something like that. Um, so, a march. And notice how the sound of the march resembles the eye of da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum. If I play that audio file one more time, does the stress come on the beginning of the foot or on the second foot? So when it first starts, is it da dum or is it da dum? What do you think? Maybe a little hard to catch. But I, I think, I mean, because also this is another thing that's interesting. I mean, a march, when you listen to it and it plays over and over again, you kind of get lost. And you could kind of decide either way. But I think the point is, is that the iambic pentameter or the iamb to dum to dum to dum sounds like the foot of the people moving. So this isn't something, this isn't totally arbitrary the fact that English poetry sounds like this and Kenneth Morris is interested in describing it like this. I've never heard anybody describe poetry like a march ever and before, I'm sure. So Marlowe had swept on with the tempest, a wild storm, and tis grand to sweep with him, but bewildering. Shakespeare dominates the tempest and tunes it to a music that uplifts. There he is. I don't even need to put his name on the slide, because it's Shakespeare. <laughs> and some people, anyway, and that's Shakespeare, yeah. So, Kenneth Morris says, or 
before I read you the next, well, yeah. So Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Morris sees Shakespeare as somebody that tunes Marlowe's march music into sound and vision, sound and vision both, a creation to be seen and also to be heard. So he was essentially a light bringer, was Shakespeare. And his march music is in itself a thing of light. This is really, this is a really interesting way of talking about poetry. Um, so Morris sees the blank verse march music that Marlowe sets forth evolve in Shakespeare as light. So music becomes visible in Shakespeare, whereas in Marlowe it's not so visible. So the sense of sight, the sense of sound, but what light or aspect of it can be seen? In and of itself, light is invisible. Light can only be demonstrated by that which receives it. In darkness, even diamonds are in shadow. And by this metaphor, we hear music in the dark, but we see nothing of its instruments or its musicians. If Shakespeare's march music is in itself a thing of light, then by the aforementioned definition, his sight is sound, as his sound is sight. And in terms of vision, how shall we fully see the rose and intone its nature into words or poems if we cannot hear its song as well as see its petals? Like yin and yang, in complementary distribution are thus sound and vision. And Morris makes the case for Shakespeare as the one who merges together these two dimensions into a single wave of verse. So we've heard Chaucer, we've heard Marlowe, and this is from Hamlet. Am I, am I posturizing? <laughs> so, thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet, king, father, royal Dane. Oh, answer me. Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, pierced in death, have burst their caraments. Why the sepulchre, wherein we saw thee quietly inured, inurned, hath opened his ponderous and marble jaws. To cast thee up again. What may this mean that thou, dead chorus, again in complete still, revisited thus the glimpse of the moon, making night hideous, and we fools of nature so horridly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls? Morris asked the reader then to contrast the ease of reading these two lines aloud. So a line from Shakespeare. Thou comest in such a questionable shape with Marla's, if all the pins that poets ever held. Now they're both beautiful. They're both nice, but one is a little more sing-songy. It's like a little more sing-songy. The sing-songy one, I think, is Marla's. If all the pins that poets ever held. Sounds like Emily Dickinson. Success is counted sweetest by those who near succeed. Uh, Shakespeare, thou comest in such a questionable shape. But it flows. It's musical, but it isn't also at the same time. It has everything. It's compositional. It includes everything. It's beautiful. So Morris says, and, at one, and one comes at once on the secret of Shakespeare's superiority. <laughs> It lies in the perfect balance of his waves of sound, the infusion of light into them. So Morris could not have chosen a better simile. The sound of waves invariably invoke the image of them, as does a pitcher evoke its sound. And when in presence of the ocean, sight and sound are one and the same. Is it possible to trace back the sound you hear to the particular part of the wave you watch? This relationship emerges on the waves of Shakespeare's verse. The sound of this aquatic scene presents itself as unadulterated, natural music, 
Oceans do not march. They flow and crash and crescendo. Did Chaucer or Marlowe intone this kind of music into their works? It was not until Shakespeare. So at the top, Kenneth Morris says, he could carry that line also where he would, halfway to other modes of music than this marching mode we've been talking about. I know a bank whereon thy wild time blows. I know a bank whereon the wild time blows. I know a bank whereon the wild time blows. Morris explains that this line has no meter, or no known meter. It has no known meter at the time, but that it is most perfect music. A line that does not march, but sings. And to have singing is unequivocally to have music. Yes? There's a few things to take into consideration. It depends on who's reading it, I think. Um, so people who are, who are particularly sensitive to Shakespearean verse, like the great Shakespearean actors, can make this sing. Um, so in, in one sense, I humbly decline you know, myself as a singer in this case. <laughs> um, and I think when I read it silently though, I hear myself as a Shakespearean professional, kind of, and so I can hear it sing. Um, but I think what Kenneth Morris is saying here um, is the reason why it sings is because when someone sings, they're not singing like this. All you need is love. Dun, 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 dun. All you need is, like, that's kind of singing. All you need is, and then it, it, singing has different rhythms and tempos and, and it has different notes and it, it can stop and it, it has different structures. And so this meter doesn't follow the iambic pentameter. It doesn't follow any known known meter. And so in that case, it's more like the ocean. It's more like nature. It doesn't have this, you know, identifiable structure that we can go, this is rock meter or this is ocean meter. I know a bank where on the wild time blows. Da 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 da. Instead of da 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 da. It's like that's okay. Great question, and great observation, and very important observation indeed. So, thus having entered song, intonation presents itself. Intonation where the thrill of poetry intensifies. So to Morris, it was Milton who carried this evolution to its topmost. So you thought Shakespeare was the pinnacle, but it isn't yet, right? It was Milton. So we have heard the march, but what are its variations? Time marches on, but to the same beat? Does time not encompass world music with all its cultural variability and rhythms? So Milton always marches, but he marches in nearly as many ways as a poet can. So not a big distinction between Shakespeare and Milton, but I think what Morris is saying is that Shakespeare is just, he's sublime, but I think Morris is particularly sensitive and, and enjoys Milton because he sees him as a more versatile musician. Maybe Shakespeare was a great violinist and cellist, and that doesn't devalue his music, but Milton can play a couple more instruments. He can play like the timpanis or something, and the, you know, or the, the, the trumpet in addition to those, which doesn't necessarily make someone a better musician just because they can play more instruments. Um, there's Milton. Good old Milton. John, I call him John. <laughs> It's his first name. This is hard to read. Um, and really just focus on the music of it. Uh, don't get caught up in the references. Uh, 
it's not important for this discussion today. We're not talking about references. We're talking about music. I wouldn't say it's completely unimportant, but I just focus on, 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 the, on that. So, for never since created man met such embodied force as named with these could merit more than that small infantry weared on by cranes through all the giant brood of Philegra with the heroic race were joined that fought at Thebes or Ilium on each side mixed with auxiliar gods and what resounds in fable or romance or Uther's son be grit with British and Armoric knights and all who since baptized or infidel jousted in Aspremont or Maltebon, Damasco or Morocco or Trebizond or whom Becerta sent from Afric shore when Charlemagne with all his peerage fail by Fantarabia. <laughs> They're just words, nothing else, just words. <laughs> but beautiful words. And I think poetry is something that people, I know is for many, many years, I didn't like poetry and was completely intimidated by it because I got so caught up in its meaning and its representation and all that. But um, the music of it is enough to satisfy my tastes until I find a PhD scholar in Milton who can tell me what all of this means. But in the meantime, I'm gonna sing. Just because I don't, I don't, even though I don't know what the words say. Um, this is from Paradise Lost, by the way. So if you are familiar with it, you know this a little bit. Never tell me, Morris says, that this mighty Milton was not one of the world teachers. <laughs> no doubt he spoke little directly of the hidden truths. No doubt when he stooped from his bardhood to philosophize, he did it foolishly enough, but Lord, there is the whole secret doctrine of the ages in just the fall of his words, the manner of his speech. I need no better proof of the soul of man than ten lines out of Paradise Lost. <laughs> ah, I love this guy. That's a little bit later. So, um, Whatever can be said to have a composition, these are all compositions. Compositions of person and, and music and poem and person and environment. There's all, it's a whole landscape of experience. Um, yes, Monica. Chronological order, yes. Everybody's in chronological order, definitely. It does count, exactly, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put, yeah, that would be confusing, I think, sure. Um, a piece of music depends on musicians to play it, right? And in turn, an audience to hear it. So what is a written composition or a musical composition that lacks the sound of music? Perhaps nothing more than paralyzed words on paper or notes stagnant on a staff sheet of music. The life breath of poetry is music, and where there is no music, poetry seems to lack a certain pulmonary circulation akin to the oxygen in our bodies. Music makes soundless words into intoned poetry, just as the transmural eye of vision sees past the surface of life, does not fear the deeper ineffability and unfathomable nature it presents below its illusory canvas. Poetry in its true sense requires this music, this vision. Uh, many years later, many, many years later, uh, Yeats expresses the relationship between music and verse in a preface he gave to a reading of his most well-known poem, The Lake Isle of Innisfree. Um, I'm gonna play that for you. And I think Yeats, completely sums up uh, what I have been helping Kenneth Morris talk about today. Maybe I should play the audio. For, no, this is fine. So I'll, I'll read it and then we'll listen to it because Yeats has just the most amazing voice. So Yeats says, I'm going to read my poem with great emphasis upon the rhythm. And that may seem strange if you are not used to it. 
I remember the great English poet William Morris coming in a rage out of some lecture hall where somebody had recited a passage out of, it gave me a devil of a lot of trouble, said Morris, to get that thing into verse. Then Yeats, said, Yeats says, it gave me a devil of a lot of trouble to get into verse the poems that I'm going to read. And that is why I will not read them as if they were prose. Does that make sense? So his, his professor was saying, it, it, it gave his professor, it was really hard for him to um, get verse, get, get poetry into verse, where for Yeats, it was much harder to get the, uh, into verse the poems that he'd experienced. So that just goes to show you is that everybody experiences poetry. I mean, not everybody can be, can, can, has the ability of Yeats, I suppose, but that doesn't discount the experience that Yeats has and that we can all share that and understand that and relate to it. Um, let's listen to that really quick. I'm going to read my poems with great emphasis upon their rhythm, and that may seem strange if you are not used to it. I remember the great English poet William Morris coming in a rage out of some lecture hall, where somebody had recited a passage out of it gave me a devil of a lot of trouble, said Morris, to get that thing into verse. It gave me a devil of a lot of trouble to get into verse the poems that I am going to read. And that is why I will not read them as if they were prose. Okay, I know I'm going to kind of try and wrap it up. Uh, if there's still time and people really want to, we can listen to Yeats uh, read his poem, The Lake of Innisfree. Um, so, musicians are called composers because they take what is already in existence and fashion it into an arrangement or piece of music. Even the instruments themselves are made out of the stuff of the earth. There's instruments made out of wood or trees, animal skin or brass. Even the guitar can be amplified through electricity another rearrangement of the elements. We are also instruments. We are also instruments. We are born with the ability to make sound, and the first indicator of life is the cry of a baby. Like birds, we are born to sing, and we are born to listen, to hear sound. It is our way of navigation, and some of us can even develop our voice from mere vibration of the vocal folds into the most sublime musical instrument. Of course, not all of us can sing like Puccini's Madame Butterfly. However, after all, at the opera, there are more listeners than there are singers in the room. We can all listen to those who sing. Poetry did not begin its life on the page, but from the breath of humanity. Not to proclaim that the greatest poems exist only as those which can be uttered, but that all poetry, whether written or voiced, has the quality of music. So whether it be spoken or silently read, sung or written, performed or delivered, the greatest poems are all a kind of music because they take words and compose them into works of art, creations of the soul. And their deeper meaning or beauty is akin to the sound of which that music is composed. Words like sound, have limits of expression. But it is these limits, not finite endings in and of themselves, but limits for which to go beyond a transmural view of a range of expression where the poetry of words and the music of sound express deeper parts of human experience and relatedness that simply a shallow canvas of words and sound are incapable of expressing. And as much as silence gives birth to sound, silence may give birth to poetry. And as all poets are a kind of musician, not all of us are piano players or Shakespeare's and Milton's. However, as in the example of the opera house, we all have ears to hear the music of the piano. 
or the poetry of Shakespeare, all on account of the fact that communication is a relationship, not a singularity. Without an audience, the tree falls in the forest without a sound. It is because we have experienced loss, abandonment, beauty, love, pain, success, failure, triumph, etc. We know the tree calls out. We hear and listen to the poets sing. We could not read their words or hear their voice without our own. Silence is the great metaphor for what may be called emptiness or God, Brahma, the absolute, or nothing. There is nothing more mysterious than silence. The cradle of existence. The beauty from where all our voices emerge. Morris says, translated into terms of poetic literature, the lack of mysticism means the lack of eyes and ears for reality. There must be some sort of color of mysticism before you can get either vision or music. So we have music, we have vision for the sake of reality. We have music, we have vision for the sake of reality. And reality for our sake provides us with everything and nothing simultaneously. There is nothing mystical about the sound of water or the view of the Grand Canyon. But there is something mysterious, something more, something else, something less even, or hidden, that we feel so deep and unfathomably distant. Whatever it is that you feel, what is it? Your response is your poetry. Thank you. Play the eights? Just a second. I'm gonna, print, I'm gonna put the poem up on the, it's very short, I'm gonna put the poem on the screen so you can see it. I will arise and go now, and go to Inish Free, and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows shall I have there, a hive for the honeybee and live alone. In the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping like the veil of morning to where the cricket sings. There, midnight's all a glimmer and noon a purple glow, and the evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day. I hear lake water lapping low sounds by the shore, while I stand in the roadway or on the pavement's gray. I hear it in the deep heart's core. <laughs> Any comments, questions, uh, statements? Wow. Wow. <laughs> It's, they, uh, Kenneth Morris has, has one of the most unique ways of talking about literature I've ever seen in my life. And I'm only 34 years old on the planet, and I haven't studied literature for all of those, but he's, uh, he's got a very unique and very beautiful vision. Indeed. Yes, sir. What are you going to sing for us? I'm, I'm, I'm going to try some Dutch poetry for you. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, so even though you might not know it, I'm afraid that you're a poet. <laughs> I'm, I'm more afraid than you are. So my question is, what is part three going to be about? 
Ah, did you, was your question, what is... This was part two today. Yes. So my question is, what is part three going to be about? I see, I see so where we can get the commitment tonight. That would be nice. <laughs> I see where you're going with this. So I will be talking about uh, style next time. Excellent. We have that on tape. Three cameras. Thank you. <laughs> so style will be next, yeah. Good night. Or or not good night. Okay, good night. Yes. Okay. Let's first uh, thank you, uh, Ryan. And uh, I'm personally very happy that we don't have to twist your arm to have a commitment for the third part. <laughs> so we're looking forward for it. And uh, I think it becomes a collection by that time. I, I agree, yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you very much. It was very inspiring. And uh, I think you put all, all of us on a certain track to become more involved in uh, literature and poetry. Yeah? Thank you very much. Thank you, okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody.